welcome to Wool and Spinning. My name is Rachel and I can be found pretty much everywhere as well for pearls. Welcome to this place. You are welcome here. Um, I just want to uh, welcome new viewers to the show. If you have not checked out this space before, thank you so much for giving the show a try. And for those who are returning viewers and are continuing to watch, um, thank you so much for continuing to be here and to watch the show, uh, please hit the subscribe button and the like button if, if you don't mind. And to those who are patrons of the community, thank you for your ongoing patronage and for continuing to support the show. You're what keeps the show on the air week after week and the live streams and the virtual spin groups and the blogs and the teaching content and all the stuff that I love to do that involves you guys. So thank you so, so much uh, for being here. Uh, the live stream every week happens on Saturday mornings. It is for patrons. You can access the live stream each week for like a dollar a month on Patreon. You don't have to uh, pledge a lot and um, you'll be able to access um, the, the community here in the live chat and be a part of what goes on here uh, week in, week out. So Thank you so much for being here. Today's show, um, we've got lots to talk about. You can see my table is full. Um, I've got some spins that I finished up that I really wanted to talk to you about and share. And uh, we've got some community participation. I have a couple of new cast-ons and uh, a finished sweater. So it's not blocked and there's a couple of things left to do, but we are gonna talk about the yarn and we'll talk a little bit about the sweater itself. So. Very, very happy with um, uh, how things are shaping up here as we end 2020. Um, I know uh, a lot of us are still dealing with, um, you know, all of the pandemic stuff and, and the COVID and whatnot. And um, I just, my heart goes out to you. It's very, very busy here in southwestern British Columbia. And uh, I know you guys are probably dealing with the same. So I hope that you are um, finding some solace in your, in your making and, you know, when you do go out, wear your masks and wash your hands and then we can get through this together. So um, I would love to hear from you guys what you're working on while you're um, while you're watching the show. I'm sure many of you are sipping coffee if it's the morning and some of you are having some tea. Some of you, I, I don't blame you if you're having wine if it's the evening. <laughs> um, we've got lots and lots of people in the chat. Sorry, my, my shirt is stuck on my watch. Um, I am so pleased to have you guys here. Um, looks like some people are doing some repair work on some clothing. Um, oh, it's just so, so awesome to see you guys here. Um, lost power for 12 hours, Yoshe. That was fun. Oh, bummer, Alicia. I hope that you guys are doing okay. We've got Petrina and I are going to be on Woolen Spinning Radio coming up at the beginning of December, uh, sort of summing up this breed study that we did on Charolais. And um, I created a third blog, sort of a, a bonus uh, content blog, uh, blog, talking about some, um, as basically talking about the, the culmination of my study and finishing off my study. So I will link that in the live chat. So if you are, if you are um, watching the show later and you have the live chat replay going, you'll see the link there. So I know some people are saying that they're having some problems with the live chat um, lagging and whatnot. It might be YouTube, Saturday morning, sometimes really busy. Uh, you can always uh, refresh because everything at my end is okay. So I'm sorry about that if you're experiencing some, some uh, YouTube problems because it's um sometimes youtube gets really overloaded <laughs> uh that's one of the the disadvantages uh for youtube i have i will be releasing this morning our new video for patreon for 2021 just sort of giving you a sum of everything that is going on um all of the content kind of going through how everything fits together. I know it's really confusing when you first come to Patreon and it's a little bit overwhelming. You can always reach out to me and ask questions. And so please don't ever hesitate to get in touch with me, Rachel at Welford Pearls, P-U-R-L-S dot com. And just to ask if you need some clarification and that Patreon video will be linked in the show notes, um, which will be, the link will be down below after the show. 
and you guys can watch that and get up to date for those who are new to the community. And it's just an opportunity to give you kind of a rundown on how Patreon works and all the things. We've got a lot going on in our community, so please um, have a look at the show notes to see if there's any alongs that you would like to participate in. We've got our tin can knits along, our natural shades along. Um, we've got my the newsletter that I write monthly that actually is supposed to come out today, but it'll come out on Monday, uh, and that's available to subscribe at wealthforpearls.com. And we've got our book club going on in the Slack channel under hashtag books, 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 if you are interested in joining our anti-racism book club and also our Jane Austen book club. So lots going on. So please don't hesitate. Have a look at the show notes. They are linked below, like I said, in YouTube uh, when you're watching this later, and you can get an update of sort of everything that's going on here and hopefully you'll want to dip your toes in and join us. So without further ado, let's get into the credits and we'll get into the show. So I thought we would start with some of my finished yarns uh, and then we'll talk about my Albini which is behind me on my Diana and we will uh, talk a little bit about some other uh, knits that I started uh, or well started ripped out all the things. So we'll kind of start at the top and work our way down and then we've got some community participation to kind of round out the show. So product shot there we go there's my table full 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 of yarn isn't it so lovely um oh no way jenny that's wonderful this have this so the what i'm wearing is my Sava Boleyn, uh sweater it's by jessica gore it was in the publication the woods publication it is a cabled sweater i can stand up to show you guys it's a cabled sweater all the way down um it's a raglan it's worked top down you build out the yoke as you knit and um, then you work the rest of the sweater in the round, in one piece, all the way down. I did lengthen it a little bit. I can't remember what the finished um, measurements were for the sweater, but I did lengthen it a little bit. I think I made it, I think I knit it to 15. I think I knit it to 15 inches, if I can back up here a little bit without tipping everything over. Um, I think I knit it to about 15 inches. It hits just below, my hip bones are here. And it hits just below, um, just below there. I wear it a lot. Um, it is a very, very easy to wear sweater. Um, and it fits really beautifully. It's a lovely, um, a lovely knit. And the increases through the yoke are worked in a really interesting way so that as you work your way down, you're not doing a raglan increase row every other row like you normally would for a raglan she has you stagger them and so i think what actually ends up happening is you end up with a nice fit through the yoke and when i went to separate the sleeves we were away we were camping and i went to separate for the sleeves and the body of the sweater and i tried it on and it just it just feels nice and then if you put a shirt underneath right now i'm wearing a collared shirt underneath but if you put a shirt underneath a t-shirt or whatever you just have a little bit more room through the through the yoke and through that sort of um i always think of this as like an angle uh under your arms and to your body there's sort of that angle and it's nice to have enough room to move because sometimes it's a little bit if your yoke depth is too short you don't have enough room in there to move around and your shirt underneath gets all crinkled up and you're constantly adjusting and pulling and it's nice to be able to just wear your garments right so I do wear it a lot. Um, yeah. So yarn, let's talk about yarn because that's why we're here. Uh, I finished quite a few skeins this past week and I finished, and the only reason why I was able to finish them was because uh, this one in particular, this is 500 yards of organic pole worth. And part of the reason why I was able to get it all plied and spend some time at the wheel, because this was a really weird week for us. The kids have been, they're on a five day weekend this weekend, which is kind of good because the numbers have been ramping up. And so it 
kind of gives our school an opportunity to sort of quarantine for five days and give the kids sort of all a bit of separation. But it also meant that I didn't get anything done. So both for the podcast and for for my own personal making. So let's talk about this first. This is organic Polworth. It was spun over the summer on my Bosworth spindles. And I have two, I think they're called middies. They're, they're basically 25 grams each, the spindles. And they're very, very fast. And actually, I think in the intro now, I'm spinning this fiber on that spindle, but I might be spinning something else. I'm not sure. I, I just am trying to remember which video that was that Mike took of me because it was a sneaky video. He snuck that, that video of me. So if you can see, I know this yarn is quite dark, but I'll, and I'll hold it up closer to the, to the camera as we go. But, um, as you, when you have a look, I'm sorry about the links this morning. I had plugged in all of the links and then when everything went to reload, the links were all for last show. So I'm really sorry if people are having problems. I popped into the Slack channel to let you guys know and reposted everything. And I republished the, the, the Patreon post. If you're ever having problems getting into the live chat or the live stream, sorry, reload the Patreon post, like actually physically reload it. Um, because usually something's gone wrong and I've had to fix it. So I'm really sorry to anybody who, uh, had, had problem. So it is very festive, isn't it? And it's funny cause this isn't sort of meant to be like a Christmas spin. It just was sort of one of those braids that I have been hoarding in my stash. This is Kinfolk yarn. Uh, Kylan is just an incredible person. She's an amazing dyer. And what I, what I did with the fiber originally, I took the braid and I laid it out and the photos are actually in the end credits at the end of the show. So you'll be able to see how I laid out the fiber. I took the entire four ounce braid and I actually stripped it horizontally. So I actually stripped it once down the middle and I all the way down the length of the four ounces. And then I took that half and I just wrapped it up and put it aside in my spinning bag. So that was going to be spun to one, um, spindle. And then the other one, I stripped one more time and didn't do anything else with it. I, and I just wrapped them up into little nests. Uh, basically I quartered the, the length of the braid. That's basically what I did. And then I spun them end to end. So, and when I got to the end of the one braid, I had to reverse the other braid because the color way ended at the end of the braid. It was the, it was the wrong color to basically start at the beginning of the other half. So I just reversed it and mirror spun them. Um, so the, the result is that both of the spindles were spun through the colorway multiple times. So red to the tealy blue, to the green, to the tealy blue, to the red, to the tealy blue and so on all the way through to each spindle. And then I plied, I just did, I wound them onto weaving bobbins, just like Threadbender does, just like I've talked about here on the podcast. So I just wound them off of my spindles onto weaving bobbins. Threadbender is um, at Threadbender on um, Instagram. She does most of her singles on spindles and then she plies on her wheel. This is all tangled. Sorry guys, let me just fix it. Yikes, it's all like tangled. And if you notice, I just want to pull this apart. That's why I picked it up. If you notice, look at how the colors matched up. I just can't believe it. All that red in there, all of that green and blue, that teal, um, all matched up. All of that um, in here, that green, I was shocked. I did very little breaking down, very little stripping. And it matched up just at, that was my plan with this one was to try to do slow, long transitions of color. And, um, somebody at, said in the chat, I saw at the beginning, um, they were wondering if I had gotten a, a 
haircut. I didn't. My hair is just getting longer so I can start to wear it down again. <laughs> but thank you for noticing. Um, so it ended up being all of these long, slow transitions of color. And that was just from minimally stripping the braid, really being careful about keeping my length of draft really consistent on the spindles. And this is one of the things that I really love about spindle spinning is that um, I find my yarns are actually more consistent because you've got the spindle dropping down at sort of a, a regular interval and you're just going through the motion. And I find I get into this real rhythm and sometimes I, and I feel like spindle spinning for me personally is slower than spinning on my wheel, but my yarns are always more consistent. So even though I applied this on the wheel, uh, the yarn overall is more consistent. And then I got that lovely transition of color. So I think Dorothy's asking what the weight of the finished yarn is. I think that it's a, a light sport, heavy fingering. I don't have my wraps per inch guide right here. It's actually over there on one of my wheels, but to me, it looks like about 16 wraps per inch. Uh, I, this is washed. It did poof a lot and I put a ton of ply twist in. So for every length on my magic craft, Susie, I plied at 27 to one. And for every length of, of yarn from the, as I was plying from the orifice to where I was holding it at my hip, I think it was about probably about 40 inches. I put in eight treadles but on the eighth treadle, I wound on. And so that gave me, and I'll hold this up to the, to the camera. Let me move over here a little bit so that I can show you guys. Um, that gave me this really, really tight twist angle and just, uh, with all of that twist, it came off the wheel and off the bobbin. It was incredibly over twisted. It was kinky and curly and there were lots of curly cues and it was um, just incredibly over twisted. And the Polworth can handle that because of the fine crimp. And because remember Polworth has about eight crimps per inch. And so putting in that amount of twist um, into that length of yarn resulted in this lovely 40 about 45, 40 to 45 degree twist angle, about 45 degrees, I think, twist angle, and resulted in a yarn that hangs absolutely straight. Isn't that incredible? I put in all that twist and all that curly cue, all that unruly crimp, or twist, sorry, and you end up with a balanced yarn so, so highly twisted, which is lovely. I love that. So, yeah. It is really pretty up close. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, thank you. It's very round. You're right, Jenny. It's very, very round, very plump. It's got a lovely hand to it. I fit this all onto one uh, bobbin. And actually, it's funny, now that you guys have said that it was kind of festive, you're right. Like when I hold it back, it's got that lovely kind of cranberry red. I do need to re-skein it because um, the in the washing, the skein got kind of beaten up. I didn't thwack it, I only snapped it. So I soaked it in the hot water, um, water warm enough that you would do your dishes in with some eucalyn, and then I just went around and snapped it all the way around like this. Just put my palm inside and snapped it out like this, and then I just hung it to dry. It took forever to dry because it's getting cold here, and I couldn't put it outside. And my yardage, when it came off my skein winder, uh, before washing and, and loss of, of yardage in the washing process. Cause you always, your yarns sort of plump up and they sort of, you know, you lose that maybe 10%, maybe 15% depends on the fiber, depends on the yarn, depends on the finishing technique. Um, I had about 500 yards when I, when I wound it off. So I'm thinking that I will probably end up with like 425, maybe 440. We'll see. I'll reskein it. I've got enough to do something with. And I have some yarns that I can do something with it with. So that is the organic Polworth from Kim Folk. And I can't remember what the colorway was called. And I'm not sure if Kylan is dying right now because she's had some health stuff going on. And I'm not really sure um, 
yeah, maybe Diana knows actually, because she's, I just noticed that Diana, hi Diana, she's in the, in the chat. My spindle spun yarn is my best yarn in terms of consistency and finding the right twist and density balance for the fiber. Yeah, I'm finding that too, Diana, and I just don't do a lot. Um, Kim, thwacking is where you take your yarns. I do this with my woolen spun yarns. So envision this being wet. Um, I fold them in half and I literally thwack them against um, a hard surface. So I might do that against the bathtub, the side of a shower. You have to be aware of what you're thwacking against because if you thwack it against something like brick, um, you're going to really rough up the outside of your yarn and that may or may not be what you're going for. That may or may not be what you want. Um, so with my worsted spun yarns, especially if I've gone to the effort of rewinding my yarns and putting them back to the first spun end, which we've talked about a lot on the podcast over, over time. I don't thwack them because I don't want to rough up the outside. I've gone to all that effort of keeping it smooth and I don't want to create a whole bunch of unnecessary halo. Uh, it does help um, to fold your yarns if that is your, your um, goal is to full, full your yarns. But um, I usually only do it with my woolen spun yarns. So talking about woolen spun, let's talk about these two yarns. Do you have the high speed head for your Susie? Um, I do. I have the, um, I have the, I have the lace flyer and the high speed whirl. Um, and actually I just ordered some, I have some fat core bobbins for my lace flyer on my Susie, but I actually would really like to get some baby bobbins. Um, so I actually just ordered them, uh, because Mike's going to give them to me for Christmas, which is wonderful. So I finished these two. So this yarn I spun during spin together. These are both CVM roving that Gre my friend Greta, back to basics, many of you know her from being in the community. Uh, we split this fleece together. And during spin together, I spun this fiber, this yarn. Uh, both of these singles are the same single. So they're both spun long draw. They're both spun um, from pre-drafted pin, dra sorry, pin drafted roving that I also pre-drafted. So I took the pin drafted roving and I just very gently attenuated it and just get put a little bit more air in it. And then this is a three ply, which I did during spin together. And I think I have a total of about 488, just shy of 500 yards of the three ply CVM that I did during spin together. I was hoping to do more, but that was that's what I did. That's what I got done. And then this past week, I had an entire bobbin full of singles. And so I did some two ply. So these are both the same yarns in the sense that the singles are the same. They're finished the same way. They were both soaked in hot, hot water with some eucalyn. And I just use eucalyn because that's what I can get locally. I've never used soak, but I've heard good things. And um, they're two, the resulting yarns are very, very different. So let's talk really quickly about how I did the CVM. So it was all on one bobbin. So what I did was I took the bobbin uh, from my, I actually did have been spinning this on my Lundrum Saxe Me. So I took that bobbin and I put it on my Lazy Kate and I wound a center pull ball and then I plied. And so I applied this onto my Magic Craft Susie because it was set up for plying already from plying my Kinfolk. And one of the things about plying from a center pull ball, there's been a lot of discussion in the spinning community in general about spin it, about plying from center pull balls because a lot of people don't like plying from center pull balls because they feel that this the center yarn that's coming out of the center of the uh, ball is getting more and more twist and the one on the outside is not having as much twist added. So if you notice, especially with your worsted spun yarns, uh, where your singles are worse to spun and they're a little bit thicker, you'll notice in your finished yarn that one of your singles is more tightly twisted than the other singles, which is an interesting effect and it's an interesting aesthetic in your finished yarns. But I find with some of my softer spun singles, like these ones, these, these CVM singles that were more softly spun, they are uh, much, much more 
able to take that little bit of extra twist as it comes out of the center of the ball. And I find that the resulting finished yarn, it, you, I can't tell the difference between this being plied from a center pull ball versus not. Um, so for me, I use this technique a lot when I'm sampling and it's a really great way for me to be able to create a bunch of yarn very quickly to then be able to sample and knit it and sort of see what I want to do with it and what sort of what direction I want to go in because I'm finding that my samples are getting bigger and bigger because I'm doing more things with them and I'm trying out more things. So one of the things with this two ply is doing a sample of these two yarns and knitting a, a big swatch to see how these two yarns would work up together with the goal of some sort of a color work yoke um, because I don't have a ton of yardage of the red one in the sense of doing an entire sweater, but I maybe have enough to do quite an intricate yoke. And then this would be uh, the body of the sweater. So that's sort of what I'm thinking. And so I need to do some sampling. And then obviously I need to spin the rest of the singles of the CVM. So I haven't abandoned the three ply CVM. Um, I do have 500 yards spun. So I do have enough to sort of do something with this yarn. But um, I also have a lot of fiber and, and that, that fleece was pretty significant, even though Greta and I s split it. Um, and so I think I'll, I'll play around with that some more. I see there's a couple of questions in the chat, so I'm just going to pause and um, make sure that I uh, answer them. So uh, I am picturing bashing it on the table like bread dough. Totally, Kim. Yeah, absolutely. When you're talking about thwacking. Do you have... Um, you... Yeah, it's true, actually, Diana. That's an interesting comment. So with when she, she was saying that on her spindles, she finds that she really stays in the moment, whereas on her wheels, she can get into a real rhythm and almost a, tra a trance and, and tends to lose track of the spin. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, I'm trying to learn. Uh, Becca said I'm trying to put in the middle a put in the time at the wheel because I have so much to learn. You know, it's funny. I think so much of what we learn on our spindles do does go across to our wheels and you still need to spend time working with both. How do I set up my wheel differently for applying? So basically it's just where the head is. So with the Magicraft, um, I have a Susie, um, a Susie pro, um, I can move the, the head back and forth to the left or the right. So when I'm plying, I tend to put it over towards my left and, um, I put my uptake a teeny tiny bit higher and I take my lace flyer off. So the smaller flyer and I put on my bigger flyer and use my full size standard bobbin. So there's a couple of things that I do that I change because generally I run my magic craft with the baby bobbins, sorry, with the fat core bobbins, which is why I want to get some baby bobbins because they have the smaller core uh, and with the lace flyer. So I just make a couple of changes. So when my magic craft is set up for plying, um, I, uh, if I've got some stuff saved up, I do tend to try to get it, get it plied. Um, I do tend to do all of my plying on my Magicraft. Um, it is such a fast wheel. And with that 27 to one ratio, um, I do tend to be able to ply quite a bit of yarn quite quickly. So I do tend to ply on that wheel. And then I spin singles on all of my other ones. Yeah, I could totally do uh, the three ply on the cuffs and then the cuffs would uh, last for longer. That's so true. Um, so Kelly does the same thing. She puts a higher uptake as well and goes much faster. Applying a worsted spun yarn is actually my favorite step in spinning. You know, it's funny you would say that, Kelly, because I remember saying that to my friend Diana, actually, uh, when I was first uh, coming back to spinning. I said to her, I love plying so much. Like, why do people hate plying? Because to me, it's like the time when your yarn really comes to life. 
The reason why my merino uh, yak is sitting here actually is because this is my two ply. I, I It's finally dry after getting it washed uh, a couple of weeks ago. But like I said, it's been cold here. So it really poofed up. Uh, I didn't put as much ply twist into it as I put into the organic pull work. But I did put quite a bit into this. But it really relaxed afterwards. And it's really, even just from sitting here on the table for the last week, waiting for its moment to shine on in the spotlight um, under the camera, it's fuzzed up a little bit. So I am tempted to put it back through the wheel one more time and tighten it up a little bit more just for durability more than anything, just to give it a little bit more twist. Uh, because the plan with this yarn, so I'm not sure if you guys remember those who are just tuning in for the first time to the show, this is West Coast Color 50-50 um, Yak and Merino. And this is uh, Lynn's Karma blend. And I ended up accidentally, I, I feel a little bit lush for having done this, but I have three, uh, these aren't really braids, but I have three lengths of this fiber in this colorway from Lynn. And then I have three lengths of fiber in this colorway, same base. So these are both Yak and Merino, and the one is in this colorway, and you can see that it's got the blues in it versus the rust oranges and the gray green, but then you've got hits of both of the color of, of sort of this purpley dark rust color. You've got the gray in both of them. Um, you've got the purple, in both of them, which is in here. Um, Lynn uh, tends to pour the dye on, so it's a little bit different um, the way that her fiber comes out. And so what I did was I, I had bought three of these during Fibers West back in March, and then I ended up buying another three in the summer because I thought, it's kind of silly. This is why you need to toss your stash and know what you've got. Um, I thought that I hadn't actually bought the three lengths of the three braids of fiber when I actually had bought them, which is totally lush. So what I've done is I have a total of 300, no, 600 grams of fiber of this base. So this is the first hundred and, um, no, that's not right. They're 50 grams each. So I have 300 grams. Sorry, uh, math, Rachel. And what I would like to do is a color work garment of some kind. So this will be the, the contrast color in the color work. So I was looking at some of the Marie Wallen sweaters where you've got color work all the way through the entire garment, not just the yoke. Um, and I've been doing one single of the one colorway, one single of the other colorway, and then plying them together. So that's kind of how that's going. But I would, I think this needs to be tightened up a little bit. The yarn is so soft and it can certainly handle more twist for sure. So let me just reach up here and show you under the camera. This is the um, yarn up close. And you can see like there's a pretty good tw twist angle on there. Like it's not terrible sort of about 40 degrees, not bad. And gorgeous earth tones, really, really beautiful colors. I mean, Lynn's colors are just beautiful, just like Kylan of Kinfolk. But if I were to tighten it up and give it just that little bit more twist, once it's washed again, it would poof right up. So just tighten it up a little bit in comparison to the existing, that would be the contrast. And um, I think that would really go far in terms of wearability and durability in a finished sweater. And uh, again, my plan is to use some of this um, CVM that I've spun, both the three ply and the two ply, and sort of see how that how that knits up together because I have a whole other CVM roving that was processed in the same way as this light, light tawny gray, but the other one is more brown and it would look great with this fiber. So those are kind of long-term plans to work on over the course of 2021. Yesterday on the Wool Circle, on the live stream yesterday morning, uh, for those who are part of that um, on, on Patreon, I talked about what I want to do with my Make Nine 
for 2021. And I'm going to do something slightly different than what I did in 2020 because I don't want to add nine more sweaters to my, um, to my wardrobe. Again, um, I, it was really fun to do that. And I just cast on the ninth sweater this past week, which I'll talk about next, but I don't want to add another nine sweaters. Uh, it's too much and it's unnecessary in terms of like being able to wear them. So let me just put away my Yak Merino because it does get quite fuzzy if it gets, um, when it gets sort of manhandled a lot. So that's definitely a fiber, shorter staple, very fine. Um, you want to really try to sort of preserve that, the integrity of the, of the fibers. So let's talk about this CVM rowing. This was another CVM uh, mohair blend. This is the one from Small Bird Workshop. You might remember this yarn from uh, being spun and two plied. I did some, I did all of it on my Ashford E spinner back in August when I went camping with my mom. I did all, I think I had, did I have 350 grams? Uh, 300 grams, I think I had two 100 gram, 150 gram bundles. I can't remember. Anyways, I had a thousand yards of yarn to play with and I held it double and I knit the love note. But as you can see, <laughs> this is now in skein form. So I have been going through the hem last week just tipped me over the edge. And I was like, okay, universe, I hear you. I get it. This sweater is not meant to be. That's fine. I'm okay with that. Um, I just had had enough. And so I actually ripped it out. Um, and I ended up re, I washed the yarn. And I cast on for what I was originally going to make out of this fiber and out of this yarn. So that's kind of silly. Um, and I am doing one of Anka's trick, one of Anka's trick uh, patterns. It's called Little Love. I would highly recommend looking it up. The pattern itself, oh my goodness gracious, you guys, the patterns. My knitting style, um, it, I actually removed twist. Um, Diana. Yeah. So, um, it really, um, when I am knitting a Z fun yarn, I actually untwist it so badly. Um, like cable yarns when you finish with Z spun that I need to make sure when I do my cable yarns that I finish with an S spun yarn. So I've had to really like kind of figure all of that out and, and take the time. So yeah, great question, Diana. Cause yeah, the yarns um, for me need to be a little bit more higher twist because I take twist out. Actually, um, what do you do, Diana? Do, do you add or remove um, twist? Because you're a continental, you're, I knit continental, but you're a thrower. So I'm curious. So this is the pattern from Little Love. Like, look at the detail. I love paying for and supporting pattern and knitwear designers who put this much detail into their patterns. Like to me, it is worth, it is worth it. It is worth every penny. Amazing pattern thus far. This is a contiguous construction. So with the yarn itself, what I end up doing, I tried to get some video of, of me and Mike untangling this yarn because it was held double for the love note, right? And you knit it on six millimeter needles. And um, so what we did was I, I wound all of the yarn into center pull balls. And then I set up both of my ball winders. I have an old plastic Royal, Royal uh, ball winder. And then I have a Strouk wooden ball winder. So I got both of them going. Mike was running them. I was holding the ball and slowly unraveling it. So I put it into a big stainless steel bowl on the floor, the, cent the, the ball itself, the wound ball. And then we pulled from the in from the center and I just very gently, very slowly have been pulling all of the yarn apart. So you do all 500, 600 yards, whatever it is to get my thousand yards of yarn back. It has been such a good learning experience because it's really helped me to appreciate what good quality yarn this was. I'm just gonna toot toot puff puff for a moment. This is washed, rewashed and reskained. And it has, other than a little bit of halo, it has really like been able to, to handle it. Um, the, the, the yarn is 
yeah, it, it, it looks like it did when I freshly spun it. I'm really impressed with myself. Now, some of that is the mohair and the CBM and just being able, like being able to handle that. Um, this yarn was spun with a slightly higher twist singles and then it was gently plied. Um, so the singles were high enough twist that they were able to handle that added twist. Uh, or sorry, that added um, wear and tear of being knit, re-knit, ripped, re-knit, and then, and then ultimately ripped out and then separated from its mate. So uh, the, the two two-ply yarns that I held together for the love note um, really, it really did well. I wasn't sure what to expect. I was like, maybe it'll start to rip and fall apart when I start to pull it apart, but it did really, really well. And then I started Love Note. So I've just been very slowly working on this. There is no time frame for this. It's not going to be finished in 2020. Um, this is the ninth sweater in my Make Nine goals for 2020. Can you believe I've knit eight? Oh, I've I've knit so many sweaters this year. Um, part of me is really proud of that, like that I was actually able to do it. Um, yeah, it's just kind of a, a you know an accomplishment, right? And so what you do with this is you cast on with a provisional cast on, you do the collar. So this actually fits. Let me put it on, on Diana here. So that I can show you guys. So let me put it to the big camera just for a moment and then we'll go back to the product shot. So um, this is the back of Diana and this you actually cast on at the back neck so that's the provisional cast on here and you place a row marker um for your for your right side um your for the right side there we go that's a bit better and then this becomes your shoulder um, this becomes your shoulder seam. I know it's, I know it's high up, um, but I, I can't unfortunately do anything about Diana's height. She's, she's just tall. Um, so this is your, your, um, actually, you know what I could do? Hang on. I don't mind adjusting the camera a little bit just to help you guys out and it's going to fall again. There we go. That's a bit better. And then you guys will really be able to see. There we go. Okay. Come on, sweater. Come on back. Here we go. Okay. Can you guys see that a bit better? So this is your provisional cast on here for your collar. And then you work your way out and you work your way out. And then after that, and you break your yarn. So you keep breaking your yarn, which I, I hate doing, but for a, for to learn a, a construction like this, I'm, I'm definitely willing to do it. And then you work your, 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 your cast on here. Uh, and you um, cast on a certain number of stitches and then you work your way all the way back, all the way across so that you cast on these stitches and then you start to work down. And basically what you're doing is creating a drop shoulder um, for this particular pattern. Some contiguous constructions, um, you start to work forward as well and you start to create your, um, your sleeve cap. Uh, this particular sweater, I'm pretty sure if my memory serves, um, is sort of a, a, a drop shoulder. So once this is washed and blocked, it'll relax. And um, the, the sort of aesthetic of the, of the sweater is, is more of a drop shoulder, but it is still a contiguous construction. Because basically what's going to happen is once I get to the, the, the back, I'm going to work my way down the back of the uh, shoulder girdle, and then I'm going to come back. I'm going to break that yarn and I'll come back and then you work your way forward. So that's sort of how the construction is. It's very, very different. Um, Coco Knits has sort of um, done contiguous construction. Um, that's sort of been her claim to fame, if you will. Um, I've heard mixed reviews. Some people love contiguous construction and some people don't. So it's definitely something to try and to see if you like it and then to go from there. Um, and if anybody has any questions about um, contiguous construction, let me know. Now, the other cool thing about this sweater is there is a lace 
pattern in there. It's really hard to see right now because the yarn is kind of kinked and um, some of this yarn was washed and some of it wasn't because um, at first I sort of wanted to see what it would look like if I didn't wash and block the yarn again or not block but wash and finish the yarn again before knitting with it again but I decided in the end to, to take the time to wash it so that's why I haven't been working on it so much so right now the lace pattern is really hard to see I think when it's all over you'll be able to see it a little bit better that just that there's a bit of patterning it won't be really super overt and it's not super overt in her sample um it's just very very um What's that word? Uh, it's very um, subtle, just very subtle. So we'll see how that goes. So wish me luck. Yeah, solid singles twist. <laughs> it's important to make sure that your yarns are structurally sound and stable. Um, I wanted to give you guys a really quick update on my uh, pink uniform barf sweater for, for Nora. I separated for the sleeves and um, uh, put them on hold. This is Let Loki. It's commercial yarn. This is for Nora for Christmas. It is so big. Um, this actually kind of fits me. It would fit the 14-year-old across the street. That is how big this thing is. Um, it's like massive. The, 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 the chest alone, it's all crunched up on, on stitches right now, but the chest alone is like, is, is 31 inches around, which, and I'm a 33 inch bust. So like it's big. Nora is a 25 inch bust. So I talked to virtual spin group about it cause I, I have gauge, um, and it's just coming out really, really, really big. And so I had cast on for the six to eight size, knowing that I had gauge, but I need to go down to like the five, the five-year-old size. This is just way too big. And she likes it now. Pat had a really, really good point. She really likes this now. She has picked this out now. And it's better to have her have it fit and have her wear it now than make it so big that it'll fit in three to five years. And then she's not into it and she doesn't like it. So I'm with her on that. I think that she's absolutely correct. And um, I, I should send it to you, Jenny. You can finish it. Um, you can. She's a 32-inch bust. Um, so I'm going to rip this out and I will re-knit it. It will get done for Christmas. But um, it was a little bit of a letdown. So I just kind of put it aside for a few days and gave myself a break. So let's talk about Albini. We're going to have another long show this week. I hope you guys don't mind. Let's talk about the yarn first, um, because the yarn has been just such a journey, and um, I love this yarn so, so, so much, and I had posted on Instagram last night, you know when you're like finishing up a sweater, and there's this part of you that is so sad and bummed to see it be done, and then there's this other part of you that's like, oh my goodness gracious, like I am so done with this sweater. I'm kind of on the fence with this one. This has been such a labor of love and I spun the yarn as I was knitting this sweater and I've told that story several times on the podcast so I won't go into it again. But it's been one of those things where I've just kind of, I'm at that point now where I'm like, I just want the sweater. I just want to be done. This is a purely product sort of time in this sweater construction uh, for me. So a little bit of background on this fiber. This is Shetland. It's from Disdero Ranch here in Taffin, British Columbia. Uh, she is at uh, DisderoRanch.com. Um, if somebody wants to, if they find the website, they can link it in the show notes if they, if, if you don't mind, um, or like in the live chat. So what I ended up doing was a three ply for this sweater. And this was my, my control card. So my wraps per inch for these singles was about 30 to 32. It was spun long draw. And then my finished yarn was a three ply that came out sort of as a sport weight light DK. The finished yarn is incredibly light. It's very airy. It's very woolen. Uh, it has a real, it just screams jumper sweater to me and very rustic. And um, this gorgeous, gorgeous brown color. And I had thought about maybe dyeing it and over dyeing it and doing it like a dark army green or something but I just love the rustic nature of this and I had buttons in my stash that worked really well 
for this particular um, fiber and this particular yarn. So I ended up, I have five left over. I had uh, 12 of these buttons in my stash. I think I had gotten them on sale at Dress So in downtown Vancouver and I had sort of thought, oh, I'll use them eventually. So I sewed those on last night. I didn't do what I did for my short cardigan and knit them on as I went because I wasn't sure that I was going to be able, like I, I ripped this sweater out so many times and fixed it and fiddled with it that I didn't want to have the buttons attached and then have to go back and take them off. Um, and as it is, I need to adjust slightly where the buttons are because this actually needs to be a little bit higher to sort of put the buttons where they're supposed to be. I think I, I just attached them in slightly the wrong spot last night when I was finishing it off. So let me go to the spinning of this fiber. And then you guys can ask me a couple of questions if you have any questions about it. So this was a uh, spun, this yarn, to be honest with you, it was spun on all of my wheels. It was spun on my Lendrum DT. It was spun on my Magicraft Susie Pro, which is what I'm spinning on now. It was spun on my Ashford E spinner. It got spun on everything because basically as I was working my way through spinning and as I was making my way through making this yarn, I was having to use the wheel that was available at that time. And what ended up happening was I got to a certain point where this was before I ripped it out and ripped it back to here. I hadn't done the sleeves yet, but I had basically finished the body. I had done the pocket linings and um, I still had about 180 grams of yarn to spin, fiber to spin for both of the sleeves and the collar. So I measured off that fiber from the bump that I had of the Shetland and I still have quite a bit of this fiber left over and I have a plan for it for some of it. Uh, so I went back and finished the spinning and I just took the fiber that was remaining. I divided it into three, spun to three bobbins and plied. And so I don't like spinning this way. I don't like constructing sweaters this way. I prefer uh, having all of the yarn spun plus a buffer, but that's not how this sweater went. So in the end, the sweater has about 940 yards of yarn in it. And in total, including this little, little baby skein that I finished off with, which is nice to have a little bit of yarn left over at the end. You always want to have a little bit, of, at least a little bit <laughs> of yarn left over for finishing later. So this will get labeled and I will put this into my samples bin because if this sweater ever needs any repair, I need to have some yarn left over. So I don't know if I've ever mentioned that on the podcast before that I do that, but I do. So in total, I actually spun uh, 996 yards of yarn. So just shy of a thousand yards. And the only thing left on this is the pocket lining. So, um, if nobody has any questions about the actual spinning itself, I'll go to the big, the big screen and I'll back up and adjust the cameras and we'll talk a little bit about this sweater. So this is not washed. It is not blocked. And I haven't actually done the pockets yet. I haven't, um, I haven't actually uh, finished the pocket lining. So here is, um, I don't know why she's so, in some ways she's quite tall today and in some ways she's not tall. So I haven't sewn these down yet. So these are the pocket linings. So what you do is you knit your way down, you work a couple of decreases through the side of the sweater for your waist shaping, which is what messed me up last time. And I talked about that quite extensively on the podcast before. Um, and you cast on a certain number of stitches for the front of the cardigan and then you um, put these stitches on hold and the stitches are held for the pocket until you're ready to go back and pick them up and knit the pocket lining itself. Now the original pattern, I it doesn't call for any side increases. So once you get to here, the sweater kind of has like a cocoon shape sort of. And I just, it didn't fit across the hips. We talked about that quite extensively last week, how it was just too tight across here. And I 
ended up with a 30 inch hip measurement. And of course the sweater was like stretched really, really badly like this and would never button up all the way to the bottom, even if I had wanted it to. And part of that was because I lengthened the sweater as well. So the sweater is supposed to be about 13 inches. It's supposed to come to about here. And I added, um, I made it 16 and a half inches long, 16 inches long, 16 pre-blocking. So I did change the pocket construction a little bit. So instead of casting on the these stitches down here, working down, coming back, picking them up and working them to finish this lovely detail in here, what I ended up doing was I actually separately cast on the number of stitches that I wanted to and I added a few extra stitches to make the pockets a little bit wider worked the one by one rib, did the braid, and then placed those stitches on hold until I got to where I needed to start for the pocket. So that was having the um, insight from ripping it and having to redo it all, that that would maybe be a good idea. And so I did that the second time round. So this was actually knit, cast on, knit the braid, and, and then it waited until I could Put those stitches on and keep knitting down and if you're confused about that and you want to make the sweater when you get to that point just get in touch with me and i'll help you to navigate that now the one thing that's left to do is the pocket lining so what i am actually going to do this afternoon hopefully fingers crossed all goes well um, i am actually going to press with the iron on a very low setting i'm actually going to press the pocket here and just give it a, a gentle a gentle press. Um, and then I can tack it down to the wrong side and then I'll sew it down and then I'll wash and block. So that's kind of my plan. Now the other really interesting thing about this sweater that I wanted to highlight is the collar. So you pick up the collar after you have finished your button band. So you pick up and knit your button bands, do your button holes, and then you pick up for your collar all the way around. Then, you knit a couple of rows and then you work short rows. And that's what creates this lovely, um, slightly higher collar at the back and this sort of lovely shaping at the front where your, your top button at the top of your button band, right, right there at the top of the sweater, um, actually, you know, sits where it's supposed to, it looks right and you don't have all of that bulk here. So I tried this on this morning with this shirt underneath um, before I threw it on, on Diana, and it fits really beautifully because of that. Like it looks right. It sits properly where, where you would want your sweater to sit, um, which I really appreciate. I appreciate those little fit nuances. Um, so that is that sweater. If anybody has any questions about anything, please don't hesitate to speak up. Um, I, did, I did change quite a bit with the sleeves to size down the amount of fabric that was in here. I'm really glad that I did. Um, so I did several increase uh, decreases underneath after I had picked up for the sleeve. I think I decreased about eight stitches uh, through here and then just worked the sleeves um, all the way down to about a cuff that is about eight inches around in circumference, which is what these are. And I really like that that thickness for my sleeves. It seems to work really well for my, my arms and my wrists. So that is that sweater. I'm really happy with it. Once I wash and block it, I'll talk about it some more, uh, just to kind of give you guys a bit of a, a, a finishing sort of how that all went. Um, and we'll chat a, a little bit more about it once we get, once I get it, once I get it done. So if anybody has any questions, don't hesitate. Um, it does fit me really well. And I am so glad that I went back and it did those, those, uh, hip increases. So what I had done last week was I had ripped it all back and I added three increases down the side. So from, from the waist, this is the waist here. You can see how it naturally goes in and then it naturally comes out again. I added three increases right through here at the top, the top half. So the last one was approximately here and I did three. So I added 12 stitches um, and that really made a big difference to the fit of the lower, lower hem of that sweater. So thanks you guys. 
All right, let's talk about community participation. For November, um, a comment here on YouTube, not in the live chat, but in actual YouTube, like in the comment section below, or on Ravelry, I have put the link um, in the show notes um, for the episode thread. Let me just actually pop it into the live chat. Oh, I'll answer your question in just a sec, uh, Jenny. Um, the prompt this month for the giveaway um, is to tell us about your favorite items that you've made based on an emotion or a feeling. So this goes with our 51 yarns spin along prompt, uh, study this month, which is emotional yarn for group A. Um, so tell us about your favorite item that you've made based on an emotion or a feeling. So maybe feeling frustrated, feeling sad, feeling angry, uh, feeling annoyed, feeling happy, feeling joy, feeling excited, and you cast something on to honor that feeling or emotion. So um, share that. And what we're actually going to do for the giveaway this month is I the giveaway will be an invitation to whomever wins to join us for um, an episode for a for a virtual spin uh, group meeting for queries and explorations. And that happens twice a month after the live stream. So we had one last weekend and we've got one next weekend. So I will be inviting that person who wins to come and join us uh, in uh, one of those meetings uh, in December. Um, and if the December dates don't work, we can always look at January too. So for hand spun knitting, Mary shares and um, at MJM, she has, uh, based on the comments for the October episodes, it got me thinking and moving. Here it is November and the year is almost over. While I am not a deadline person, I let I did let my goal of learning more about blending slip away from me. So this week I got the drum carter out and I started to play. I am going for a yarn that would be similar to Daylight by Harrisville Yarns. So if you're familiar with that yarn, that's um, what she's trying to create. I also wanted to compare how my colors would look if I put them through the drum carter once, twice, and three times. And of course, I started sampling with the finished yarn. So beautiful knitting there, Mary. I'm excited to see this finished. Um, what, I think it's a blanket that you're making. And you can see her lined up samples. She's got, um, you know, the blunt, throwing it through once, throwing it through twice, and then throwing it through a third time. It's amazing how much it changes. And uh, yeah, very cool. So quick question from Jenny. Do the top of the pockets hit at your waistline? They're about, and I guess they do but maybe about half an inch to an inch lower than my actual waist. So I've tucked this in, but my waist is here. It's about here. So it's about an inch. The top of the pocket hits about an inch lower. And the instructions in the pattern is to start your pockets at eight inches below. And I started mine at nine to compensate for my longer torso. I don't know why I remember numbers like that, but I do tend to remember numbers like that. Next, we've got Sarah R. She, isn't this yarn beautiful? This is just gorgeous. She finished some yarn and she's super happy with it. It's a Shetland Corydale Sea Cell blend that she had mentioned in the episode thread about blends and that really prompted her to just spin it. There are a ton of complimentary colors in here and I let them and I let them mix how they wanted because I quite like complex muddy colors. Me too, Sarah, and I think you nailed it with this. It's spun up to uh, around 345 meters of fingering weight yarn with incredible drape. That's the sea cell. This was really a lesson in letting the fiber tell you what it wants because, be, because before seeing down to spin, I really thought this would be a bouncy worsted weight hat yarn. Beautiful. I love that sheen. Can you guys see that sheen in that yarn? I love the colors too. Beautiful. And then Purnell shared... Isn't this yarn beautiful? I love these colors. This, these colors to me always scream Katrina because these are her favorite colors, these real jewel, jewel tones, and I just love them. So Pernil uh, shared on Slack, she finished almost 200 grams of hand dyed merino, and um, it's from a dyer in Denmark. She ended up with a three ply, 500 meters and 191 grams. She had an intention to use it with a contrast, uh, yarn which is pictured here uh in the shifty with a blue green fade as the main color because did you see those three those four yarns underneath they faded to slightly darker um 
I lost my place where I was reading, but seeing them done and together, I think it would be a shame. They would each shine on their own. And I really want to knit this and I don't really want to knit the shifty anymore. Maybe someday. I think the Merino would be nice paired with the light gray. Absolutely. Either hand spun or commercial. And I think I want to spin, but I think I want to spin that myself. I think that would be amazing for now. I am not sure which patterns to use now. I don't want to do the shifty, but I will know when the right pattern comes along and right now Christmas gifts are much more important. You know, sometimes when we um, push ourselves and we want to create something and um, we're all excited about the yarn and I, for me personally, I find if I try to create something because I'm just trying to push through and I'm not just sort of allowing the creative process to unfold, I find that I, um, I end up knitting, ripping it out. So take your time, find the right pattern. And if you're having trouble finding the right pattern, just ask on Slack because everybody will help you. <laughs> uh, people are so amazing and they've got so much cued and so much saved. It's just unbelievable. For our tin can knits along, this was a, this is a knit along that we're sort of doing indefinitely. We're using hashtag tin can knits along on Instagram and uh, Linda at naughty 54 nitty uh, knitter shares. She completed the flax for her great nephew and a barley hat to go with it. Isn't that cute? And now she wants to make an adult version for herself. I think that's beautiful. Really well done, Linda. I love the color. Now Kath has been spinning up a storm uh, for her Zero to Hero. Zero to Hero goes all year and it's an opportunity for us to support each other from the beginning of the fiber all the way through to a finished item. And what people have been making this year is just unbelievable. Um, I'm so inspired by you guys and really honest to goodness, a lot of that is the inspiration and the motivation that I get from you guys is what keeps me going with my making and my creating as well. Cause I get just as many ideas from all of you as you do from me. And uh, this yarn that Kath finished, she shared it on the hashtag sweater spin channel on Slack. She has to share this. Absolutely, Kath. It's amazing. It is her first significant fleece to yarn project destined to be a sweater. Well done and congratulations. It is an organic Romney lambs wool bought at wonder wool last year there is around 1400 meters of three ply it is approximately dk weight it's also fantastically springy i love that fantastically springly springy my plan is to dye the skeins before knitting with natural dyes probably a brownish color but still need to work that out amazing i love um uh, plays with words like that. Um, my husband and our next door neighbor were there are some of our best friends and him, they're always texting each other back and forth and they always are coming up with these crazy text messages. And, uh, recently they've been talking about the illumination celebration of this season. And that's of course, turning on our Christmas lights. So we had all agreed in the cul-de-sac not to turn on our lights until after Remembrance Day, but that because 2020 has been so challenging for everybody and we just need a bit of sparkle and light in our lives that if we if we were ready to go, we would turn our lights on on the 12th. So we did. So now we have the illumination celebration of the season has started. <laughs> it's just totally silly. Um, Rebecca shared, this is at Rebby J. Isn't this skein amazing? Uh, this was for our 51 yarns for group A for Bast fibers. So Rebecca shares what an interesting spin different from any fiber that she's spun before. She definitely vastly preferred wet spinning it as it was a bit slippery and fuzzy without it. She spun it instinctively from chunks stripped down into thirds and found it so enjoyable that she spun the entire four ounces. The lace sample was crisp, like netting. It had lots of structure, but without being heavy like alpaca or linen. I think this was rainy, if I, re if I remember correctly. I'd love to either weave with it or knit something like the, uh, like one of the, sh I think it's called Shakerage top, um, using her poofy cotton for the other yarn. Very cool. Oh, is that right, Karma? So lots of people are putting up Christmas and holiday, winter holiday decorations early this year. Yeah, I've really noticed like, there's even a couple of people in our neighborhood that already have their Christmas trees up, which for me is too early because I feel like it starts to get to be like, okay, when's Christmas coming? Cause the kids get so um, wound up. And of course the anticipation just builds and builds and builds. And it's like, Christmas isn't here yet. Christmas isn't here yet. When is Christmas coming? And then, you know, to wait six weeks, that's a long time. 
So um, yeah, I said to Mike, let's just do the lights if that's what you guys want to do in the cul-de-sac and we'll leave it at that for a while because it the, the kids are just too hyped up. They end up hyped up for weeks and weeks and weeks. So yeah. Um, we've got a few people on our street that already did their lights and then our cul-de-sac has done lights, which is really fun. So I hope everybody is well. I hope that you have a really good morning with me here. Um, I thank you so much for being here. If you have any questions about anything that was talked about in the show, please don't hesitate to get in touch. You can always leave a comment below and, um, I hope you guys have a really great week and, um, I hope you're able to get outside a little bit. It's actually lovely and sunny here. We were kind of regretting not going camping this weekend since we had five days off, but that's okay. Um, we've been able to do some other stuff. We went to, uh, did a bunch of errands yesterday and that's, that's needs to be done as well. So I hope you guys have a great, um, week. I will talk to you next week, same time, same place. And I'm sorry again about the links not working right away for the live stream. I hope that, um, you guys were all able to get in here after all. So until next time, happy spinning, happy knitting happy dreaming. I would love to hear about your 2021 plans for make nine. If you're going to do an epic, epic cloth project, um, whatever you've got planned for 2021, please, please uh, chime in and let us know until next time. Happy spinning, happy knitting, happy spinning. We already said all this. <laughs> I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye. Mm -hmm.